Real Choice Initiative is led by and for people with disabilities. Their work involves facilitating sustainable, independent living opportunities for their communities. In addition, Real Choice seeks to educate and advocate. Most recently, Real Choice has partnered with the City of Portland on creating a comprehensive survey designed to help government officials, policymakers, and the public in understanding the barriers that prevent the disabled community from living a full and truly engaged life. With us today is Alan Hines, the Real Choice Initiative Director and Project Manager, and Nico Serra, who is the project lead and board member. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So Real Choice Initiative has spent quite a bit of time, I believe, developing a survey to, uh, to get information from the disabled community and, and others with uh, health issues to find out what they need. Is that pretty much it in a nutshell? Yeah. Um, so we, we have been working on this for over three years now. Um, it's been a long haul. <laughs> that is a long time. Uh, yeah. It was a, a project that I, the city of Portland realized several years ago that as a population, people with disabilities and people with health concerns were not as engaged as other populations. And they started wondering why. And that was the impetus for this survey. Okay. And so you are not looking for any specific disability. You're, you're going the whole wide range of disabilities, which, which is huge. How do you reach all those people? How do you reach, for example, a homeless community, which has a you know, high percentage of people with disabilities? What, what has been your strategy here? Yeah, Ellen, so that's a really good question, and the pandemic has added another layer. And everyone is mostly communicating over the internet, over Zoom, over Zoom or, or whatever the platform is. It's been an interesting dilemma to figure out how to reach people who aren't on the internet. And we're not. We haven't. It's not perfect. We have. Yeah. Um, but we're trying to reach out to people in physical locations. And also um, help asking our partner organizations to help us reach out to people who might not have internet access. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's also what we're doing here. We wanted to reach out to people who are watching TV and maybe are on the internet. Um, we're also doing some shows on KABU mm -hmm. um, and uh, putting some effort out into to reaching out to, to people who are living in long-term care facilities and nursing homes and yeah. residential facilities. Um, and before the pandemic, we had this very extensive clipboard pen in hand. We're gonna go out and feed on the ground, do this sort of thing. And once the pandemic started, we really had to let go of that. And it's changing how we're doing some of that. I imagine in the long care, uh, long term care facilities, you can perhaps get some of the people working there or volunteers to, to do some of that for you, I would hope. You have a pretty good you know, crew of volunteer uh, organizations that can help out then. Yeah, actually, Alan is is a member of it's called Rop Gab is the short version of how you say it, but it's essentially the residential facility ombudsman, the long term care ombudsman and the Oregon public guardian. Uh, program has a has a state national or sorry a state board um, and Alan brought that up 
at the most recent meeting and they're helping get the word out. And then okay. Ellen and I are both volunteers with the residential facility ombudsman. We're both ambassador ombudsmen. So we're, we're getting the word out that way. Good, good. Um, are you in need of more volunteers? Is that something you could use or would you mostly want people to spread the word? Mostly spreading the word. We do have survey uh, data collectors that can help people take the survey over the phone. So if, um, you know, if you talk to someone who's an elder or someone who's blind or someone who just isn't on the internet, they don't have access, um, they can call uh, the uh, phone number, which I will, I will give you here. And, uh, we will do the survey with them over the phone. So they don't need to be able to see anything or get on the internet. We'll do it with them over the phone. Um, we really wanna make sure access is, is available. We also have five different languages available in, in addition to being able to um, do it by screen reader for people who are, who are blind or visually impaired. Good, good. Well, you've thought of most everything, I'm sure, but I'm sure there'll be something that comes up that has not occurred to you. That's usually the way it goes. Yeah, our community is incredibly diverse. We have a lot of diverse needs, and and sometimes that puts us in in conflict with one another. Um, some people might need like high highlight, uh, like visual light, and some people have a really hard time with the light. Some people can't have sense um, like perfume and you know when we try to physically get in the same space so there there's some things that are you know that make it really hard for us everybody's got their individual thing we have tried to to think of as many things as we can and we've also said if there's something happening that's making this hard for you for example we don't have it available in a language that you you read or speak let us know and we'll we'll get a translator um, for example we do have ASL interpretation available for someone, you know, if the deafblind community is another community we really want to connect with. We don't, we don't have, we don't have a lot of connections to the deafblind folks and we do have interpreters that can go out to your, your home and interpret um, tactile interpretation. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, there, there is such a variety of disabilities, but there also are so many that you can't see. So people don't necessarily know someone is, uh, is dealing with a disability in their life. I feel like that's, that, that unseen number of people is, must be a really difficult place to be. I, I'm trying to think of how you reach people that maybe don't belong to a specific organization or they don't live in long-term care, but they do have some sort of a, a disability or a long-term health concern. You, you, you're not limiting it to... Um, disabilities per se, you're limiting it. I mean, you're, you're extending it to people with, with other health concerns. Is that right? Can you explain yeah. about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, Ellen said, I feel like part of the work is, is getting to who we're trying to reach. Uh, um, and letting people know that we have, we have a very broad interpretation of disability and health conditions. We want to learn from everyone that fits in that. We think that everyone needs to be needs to be heard. And in order um, for the best policy decisions to be made, the the needs everyone's needs need to be considered. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and I, and I think, um, you know, what Alan is hitting on here, too, is that um, I think that this, this especially comes up when we're speaking with elders, is that they will not be caught dead using the word disabled. They are not disabled. I'm just old. You know, I'm not disabled. I just had a knee replacement or a hip replacement, and, and that is fine. Um, the reality is that they have just as hard a time using stairs as I do. 
and I use a power wheelchair. And so what we're hoping to do with this survey is to really assess those barriers and our, our difficulties getting into services and, um, and, and getting around the city and things like that. So um, we're really hoping that even if folks don't identify with the word disabled, that they will still take this survey and let us know, can you get can you use your sidewalk? Do you even have sidewalk? Do you, can you get to your doctor's office? Have you had trouble with, uh, you know, there's many different things. We, it's about the, the social determinants of health, which are very, very extensive. So um, yeah, we hope people will, will take the survey if they feel that they have health, imp, uh, health conditions that impact their life. And that's a lot okay. of people. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a lot of people. Um, and just to clarify this, survey is uh, limited to the city of Portland residents. Is that correct? That's right. And, and really, we, we haven't dug too much because we've been quite busy. <laughs> um, we think that this, so this is the first time the city of Portland has ever done a large study. And we think that this is probably the first time any city in Oregon has ever done this. And so we have high hopes that maybe Metro will want to do this. Maybe the city, maybe the state will want to do something like this. Um, the, the disability population, we're, we're the only minority that folks can join in an instant. Right? <laughs> what a deal. Right? <laughs> yes, that's yeah. right. That's right. It's, You're not born into it necessarily, but you might be, but yeah. Right. You know, yeah. and, and so um, wouldn't it be wonderful if Having a, you know, having something, having something happen that impacts your health in a in a profound way didn't mean the end of your quality of life, or it shouldn't mean that anyway, right? right. So as, even though there has been work done in in making things more accessible, maybe through the ADA and that kind of thing over the years, it hasn't been nearly enough, has it? Uh, you know. Um, one of one of the other um, researchers that we've been working with, Layla Hill, uh, talked about how the ADA didn't catch everything, the civil rights didn't catch everything. You know, we're we're looking back and saying, why didn't this law that was made 30 years ago do all of these things? And we're trying to, it, it's no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just to give you an example, um, Alan and I do a lot of work, so I'll take my researcher cap off for a second and say Alan and I do a lot of work in our other jobs um, around housing, ac housing access, and um, the ADA doesn't, doesn't cover housing. I will say, with this caveat, the ADA does cover if you have a community, you know, in the lobby, mm -hmm. if you have a lobby in an apartment building and there's a bathroom in the apartment building, well, the ADA covers that because it's a public bathroom and it's a public lobby, but it does not cover your apartment. Um, so mm -hmm. there, there are all these, yeah, that's technically covered by fair housing and fair housing has its flaws. So there's just, there, there are these, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, people talk about the safety nets of all the services. And um, the safety nets sometimes are like the holes are too wide and the net's too close to the ground, or it's like the other way around. It's like a spider web and it's like, got so you. Caught. Got you on his clutches, huh? so you can't, right. can't, can't move. Right. So we're like, can we build a, a tight rope that's not quite a tight rope? I want a wheelchair accessible, like one that I can like spin around on and roll down and just kind of live you know have a good quality of life and go for a stroll down i, I don't want to be one or the other i want to have yeah. a good life. yeah right. and everybody everybody should be entitled to <laughs> a good life right or or yeah. a, an attempt at it as well anyway yeah. to have a more more fair access across the board to, yeah. to everybody um you, you mentioned something about your research how has the research been going and what has been the response from the community yeah thank you for asking that you want to mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, Alan said it's been amazing. I'll start with that. So I looked over the numbers yesterday, and um, and we have over five hundred surveys taken. Responses. 
And that's across the five languages. And that's across the five different languages. And uh, I, I really dress with a response to the Chinese thing. Um, it's been, Alan said, I'm really impressed with the response from the Chinese speaking community. <laughs> we've had 50, yeah, we've had 50 Chinese um, um, uh, language uh, survey <laughs> surveys completed, which has been really cool. Um, we've had uh, almost 20 Spanish speaking surveys yeah, so, completed. So really, Some Russian, yeah. So, yeah, yeah really, really cool. really keep doing a lot of uh, we want to keep doing more outreach in languages other than like English and focus our efforts on that. Specifically, can we say um, uh, we haven't seen many responses coming in um, in the Vietnamese um, language surveys yet, um, just a few in the Russian community. Um, and we're hoping to see more Spanish speakers. Um, and what and and while we're recording this, we'll say that that this is we're just a weekend right now while we're recording this. So that's really exciting. And yeah, uh, we've always discussed that and so we already surpassed our We already surpassed our goal, which um, I'll I'll say is. So when we originally put in to do this survey, we were hoping to reach 350 people. Um, so we, we've already beat that, and, and that was over a six week period. So we have already done that. Um, and and I'll, I'll also say that one of the reasons why the city chose us to do this is because we were the only organization that wanted to do something besides a focus group. Oh. And the focus group model is bringing in, you know, a dozen or 20 or 30 or some people, it's bringing in a, a relatively small group of people and, and saying, tell us about your lives and all the things. But what happens in those situations is that you end up getting people who can, who can afford to take the day off and come and hang out and sit in a room. And it, it that's, that takes a lot of privilege. And I mean, especially around your health to be able to go and sit all day in a room that's so we really wanted to do something different where we were able to reach people and where they were at and and uh, learn from them and their experiences yeah um so uh i will before i say what you said so the, the survey is anonymous and we are able to see, Ellen said, we're able to see like how many people are taking the survey during different times of the day. And there's a spike of people taking it in the evening hours, like every day. When we know that these focus groups would never take place. So it's just really interesting. And so at the end of all of this, we're going to be writing a report to give to the city council. And, you know, we're going to be noting these things, you know, and, and saying, it we seems like those those things might be um, really instructive in future surveys they might want to do and, and other information gathering. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I understand that there is a um, gathering that's going to take place after this uh, survey is completed that's really, it sounds like as, as important as the, as the survey itself. What can you tell me about that? Yeah. Yeah, so um, after the, 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 the initial data collection, we're going to have a town hall where people who take the survey will be sent a link if, the, if they sign up for that during the survey. And it's going to be a virtual town hall uh, where, where Amanda and other uh, interpreters will be helping uh, to communicate with us. And we're going to be doing a general overview of the data that we've collected and going over the nuances and saying, did, did we miss anything? And, and really getting feedback from community members in, in a live setting um, and 
Yeah, checking back. And that was, uh, that was something that uh, when we originally put the proposal together, we worked with the Coalition of Communities of Color and they were, they were the ones that said, this is super important, you need to do this. And we completely agreed. They call it research justice. <laughs> Awesome. looping the community back in afterwards and and the hope is that we're creating a people's plan i like it we just love that it's so yeah. brilliant and so we're we're really excited about that that is going to be a huge undertaking for us it will be huge and and i don't know the way it's going you may need you know more than one session because i think you can only have so many people on it zoom i'm not sure however <laughs> how, how many how many times does a does the disabled community of all different types of disabilities ever get together in one place to talk? You know, that's a, that's a really good question. So um, the, the people with disabilities, even just identifying with disabilities as we touched on earlier, so many people don't even wanna identify that way because there's so many things that are insinuated around work and school and who you are and what you do in the world and what it means and all those things. So um, besides just identifying with us, um, once you get into the service reality and ADA rules and social security and all of these other things, um, we are all divided into different groups based on our disabilities. Um, so um, Alan, for example, um, has different disabilities than I do. Um, so he's split into one category. Um, um, IDD, uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities are split into one category. I have acquired disabilities. I became disabled uh, in my adulthood. Um, people who are blind are in one category. People who are deaf in another. Veterans are in a different category. Elders are in another category. Um, so so there, there are more categories that I'm not even getting into. So, so you can imagine that it, it becomes very difficult for us as um, as all these separate communities with all of our diverse needs to come together ever to do anything. Um, so this is really the first time that this is happening in Portland. And, and I think it I sounds exciting, you know, that to, to be is. able to do that. <laughs> it is. And um, again, Layla Hale um, is the ADA Title II coordinator up at the city of Portland. And um, really when we, when we started this project three years ago was going to be the project lead, um, and then actually got a job working for the city of Portland. Um, and then I became the project lead. And so um, we're going to be passing the baton back. We've been passing the baton back and forth with Layla. And so we're hoping that this is this whole research project is going to be like a jumping off point for us to, to continue working together because we have so much to do. <laughs> there's, there's so much work. I can't even imagine where you take it from here. So, so I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but what are your next steps after, after the, the town hall and, and that's all done? What do, you, what do you do then? Or is it all up to the city? So um, in the fall, we should mention that we are, we are collaborating with Dr. Masami Nishishiba up at the Center for Public Service at Portland State University. Um, we are going to collaborate with her to uh, put all of this together into a report and present that to the City Council in the fall. And then, and then, and then in some ways, the real work starts. Mm -hmm. um, because all of this information we hope will, we hope to make available to everyone that wants to use it. Um, and then we will have all this information about our communities mm -hmm. and what we know about how we are living and what our life experience is like. We know that we're going to need more in-depth information. Our survey is very broad. It covers many different topics. Yeah. Since the city has, uh, sorry, Alan said, we decided that since the city has virtually nothing about our community. 
in terms of data. And for the society, go broad. We decided to go broad. To instead of going deep, and, and I'll just add there that, um, so when people do take the survey, because we wanted to make sure that it wasn't taking up too much of people's time, they won't get all of the questions. Everyone is given different segments of the survey. So, so the intention is to keep it at about 20 to 30 minutes for most folks. Um, so you won't get all, you won't get the whole survey. You will get some of the surveys. Now, everybody will get demographic questions. Everybody's gonna ask for your zip code and certain things, but you, not everybody's gonna get asked about their access to healthcare. You might get access to education. You might get, so there's certain segments that not everybody's gonna get Interesting, off. okay. Yeah, and, and I assume that maybe after you come up with the report that other nonprofits can use those as a jumping off place to use and maybe lobbying for needs for their communities. Yeah. Would that be a fair assumption? Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely a, the idea. Data is the drive for policy. And the first step in policy creation is data. And so um, Alan works at Community Vision as the housing access director. He sits on five different boards. Um, I sit on two boards. Um, and I, I work several jobs doing educational, mostly educational work. Um, and uh, we, we pass state laws. We work on local laws here in the city of Portland. We do quite a bit of activist and organizing work and presentations and other things like that. So we ourselves are really excited about getting to use this, this information. And, and we're sure, you know, the disability communities, we just come up with the most brilliant, ingenious, uh, ways to get around things and deal with things. And, and I think that once we get our hands on this data, like the sky's the limit. It's just gonna be wonderful. You are very busy people, I must say. <laughs> you have a lot going on in your lives. But uh, I think the work that you're doing here is, is very commendable. And I appreciate that you're doing it for, for all of us because you know, at any point, any of us could be, you know, be part of that community and, and everybody knows somebody and everybody has a loved one that has, you know, is dealing with something. So I appreciate the work that you're doing very, very much. Uh, is there anything else you want to tell us? I, we can, we'll have the information on the screen as to, you know, the, the deadline for this and, and how to access the, uh, the, the survey, but is there anything you want to leave us with? Oh yeah. Uh, so Please take the survey. It'll be available until July 2nd at realchoiceoregon.com. <laughs> and, and, and tell your friends and have them take it too. Yes. <laughs> Sounds good. I'll get the word out, uh, especially to, to, to elders and to people who are living in institutions. We, we especially want to hear from folks uh, that aren't on the internet. Sure. Great. Thank you both so very much. I really appreciate it, Alan and Nico. And um, good luck. And I have a feeling we'll be hearing a lot more about the survey in the, in the days to come. Thank you. Take care. Time. You're welcome. And thank you to our, uh, to our viewers today. I hope you will go out there. If you, if you qualify to take this, please do take this survey, pass it along and share it with people. And to all of you, thank you from Metro East. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy.